This morning, we're going to explore love and kindness. We're going to get to that in a moment. But it occurs to me, this whole idea of faith, you know, what occurs to me is that people that are involved in the science of mind and spirit are very smart people. We're smart. And we like to pride ourselves on our intellectual capacities. And I think sometimes that gets in our way. I think sometimes that we're so smart and that we got into involved in this science of mind. And uh, I even am reminded in this moment of tales that I've heard about Ernest Holmes, who said in his later in his ministry that he wished he talked more about the heart and love and the spirit rather than the intellectual aspect of the mind. You, for the foundation students know, when you open up the Science of Mind book, there's heady stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's dense. What's another? It's thick. It's uh, and inspiring. You know, when we read it, when we can, when we when we can actually read it. I uh, I resolved to go back and start reading the the book of the Science of Mind from cover to cover because I've been a student of this thing for a long time, but realized maybe I haven't ever read the thing from cover to cover. I actually just read portions of it. When, when class asked me to, right? When the assignment said, read this. But to read it from cover to cover, and I realize that through the course of the entire book until he gets to the teachings of Jesus and to the meditations, he's talking about the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. The law of mind. And so we talk about the law of mind, and I'm thinking, okay, how can I think myself into right living? How can, I th how can I intellectualize myself into right livelihood? How can I think myself into uh, uh, prosperity and right relationships? And I've discovered for myself that I can teeter into the land, if I'm not careful, of manipulation. I can teeter into the land of, oh, if I think about this the right way, let me think about it the right way. Let me try and maybe just think about it the right way so I can manipulate the law of mind to bring me what I want. And I realize how selfish that is. And I start to realize how I'm missing the juice of the spirit. I start to realize I'm missing the juiciness of a, of a faith-filled life. Because people use their intellect to move through life. We problem solve, don't we? And so if I can solve the most problems, if I can figure out how to get the money from your pocket into my pocket, then I'm going to be prosperous. If I problem solve and I can figure out how to make people like me, then my life is probably going to be easier because I've got more people around me that like me and I can manipulate you into liking me. I've done it. I don't want to do it anymore. I realize more now that there's a bottomless pit of opulent abundance that has nothing to do with you and nothing to do with me, and everything to do with a bottomless pit of opulent abundance called God, called the Spirit, called opulent abundance. And I don't want to manipulate. I don't want to try and manipulate. And you know why I don't want to? Because I realize it doesn't work. We're smart, but we're smart people. And so we want to figure things out. You know, and so I read the science of mind, and I want to figure it out. But what I missed so much of my life, and I realized until these last few years, is the juiciness of faith. What I had been missing was wonder, awe, the great spirit, awe, the mystery of the great spirit. How much do I not know? Well, it's impossible to quantify. <laughs> it's, it's impossible to infinite amounts of information of connectivity, of science, of, 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 of connection, of oneness that I don't know. But how do I even begin to start touching it? I have to close my eyes. And I, ironically enough, have to shut my mouth. <laughs> and I have to listen. And I have to listen. I realize... One of the things that is so important for me to reconcile in my own life is what it means to stand up, the privilege, the, the absolute privilege of what it is to stand up in front of a group of people and attempt to have some sort of influence on consciousness, to attempt to have some sort of influence so that our lives can become better, so that our lives can become more filled with freedom and peace and joy. 
and the privilege of standing in front of on a class on a Wednesday night or on a sermon on a Sunday morning, the privilege that you allow me. I mean, I could be here and nobody could be here, <laughs> but you are here because we're up to something together. And so on a Sunday morning, when I say I blow hot air, because there's part of me that's aware that the relationship actually happens within. I know I'm not blowing hot air. I have a connection and there's some benefit that comes from it. And this isn't about me. It's about each one of us. But what I have to do in order to actually live a life of faith is to close my mouth, open my ears, open my heart, and listen during times of meditation and prayer. This is what faith would ask me to do. And then walk in a direction that sometimes I have no understanding of where I'm walking. But my heart knows. But my heart, there's a compass wired within my heart because it comes from the place that I come from, which could only be an infinite intelligence, an infinite spirit, an infinite compassion, an infinite love. And so to walk in faith asks me to, to walk with no evidence that it's going to be okay, <laughs> with no evidence that it's going to work out. But somehow it always does, doesn't it? Somehow it always has. Somehow it continues to. Each of us in here could probably consider a faith leap that we've made at some point in our lives. Some sort of, I don't know how this is going to, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm moved to do it. What if we lived our lives a little more like that? I wonder what would happen in the world if we did. I wonder what would happen if, we, if, if I continued to rely a little bit less on my intellect or my reasoning or my attempt to figure things out and a little bit more on, I have no idea where this is leading, but it feels right. And I know that it feels right because I take time to listen. It's not just willy nilly. Let me just base my whole life on an emotional reaction, but rather a deep attempt to understand who, who's what I really am. And the only place that happens, the only way it can happen is if I just shut my mouth, if I open my ears and I open my heart and I close my eyes and without agenda, except to walk in a life of faith, I just listen for some time. And why don't I do that more often? Because the first thing I notice when I do that is my thinker thinking and it drives me nuts, but there's a way through that. You know what the way through that is? To continue to sit there and something happens is to continue to sit there and something happens because eventually the thinker, we get worn out, we get tired, we get worn down and then surrender happens. And then we start to have in sight, an inward sight. The world prides itself on being smart. Smart people. Oh, he's very smart. Very, very smart. He's smart. He's a smart businessman. He figured it all out. How often do we talk about how deeply spiritual a person is and how realize that they just reek of their connectivity to the one power and presence of the spirit? Man, that person is just connected. That person just reeks of faith. That is one of my prayers for us, that, in a, 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 that ultimately and a, a advertently, purposely leaves us into a life of love and kindness. I, I, I go around in life and I ask myself, what is this thing called spirituality? What is spiritual? And every time I, because I want to know, and every time I ask that question and I get quiet, the only answer that comes to me is what isn't. The only answer that comes to me is what isn't. That this entire thing is but a projection of spirit's mind, spirit's heart, spirit's soul coming into living through our lives. And this is how it's said in the Bible. I want to say something about the Bible because I feel this pressing in on me to, to teach more from the Bible lately. And I know why to teach from the Bible. It's the same thing as... Ernest Holmes, you know, like it's all written from human beings, you know, it's all written by people. But there was something about the Bible and when these people wrote these, what we call scripture, right? I love the word scripture, right? Ernest Holmes, we refer to Ernest Holmes as scripture as well, right? It's scripture. 
is that these were individuals, I have faith that these were individuals that were so deeply interested in their spiritual nature and they wrote, they wrote about it. They wrote about it in this collection of books, what ended up coming to be a collection of books. And we can get into the history of that some other time. That's a topic for another time. But not even so much about the particular collection known as the Bible, but the writer and the author that wrote the particular scripture. And there's one that I want to share with you today. And, 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 and what I'm aware of is the more that I read the Bible, and I've been reading the Bible for a long time, is that there was a kind of an amassing of consciousness around certain times in history. And then people were, were, were brave enough to, to write about it and express it and, and write letters to the Corinthians and write letters to Rome and write letters to blah, 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 that attempted to influence people, right? And when we get to the metaphysical teaching of it, to have the skill set to get to the metaphysical teaching of it, there's profound truth there. And it does take some skill because a literal translation of the Buddha, Buddha Paramahansa Yogananda column, literalists, it gets us in trouble because then we use it to hurt ourselves and harm ourselves and harm another. And that's not what we're here for. That's not loving kindness. We're here to see the truth about you and proclaim it and declare it and recognize it and celebrate it. So this is from <laughs> any good, any minister loves to quote scripture too, like where it comes from. This is from 1 John 4, 9. What does that mean? <laughs> the first book of John, chapter 4, verse 9. And it says, this is how God showed his love among us. This is how God showed its love among us. God sent his only son. God sent its own being. Into the world that we might live through him. Into the world that we might live through it. This is how God showed his, its love among us. God sent his only son. God sent its own being into the world that we might live through it. What is its only son? What did Jesus represent? The anointing, the Christ, the presence of the spirit, not just as Jesus, but from time to time, there were certain avatars, saints, and sages that we can point to that remind us who we really are. Any one of us can be that to the extent that we take time to meditate, pray, go within, listen, and then be a living reminder of it. We could just go around. We don't have to preach and be on a corner and, 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 and talk about it in specific ways. We just be a representation of it. One who is anointed is one who accepts their anointing by turning their attention inward during times of stillness and silence to be remember, to remember who and what they really are. Jesus was one of these avatars, one of these saints, one of these beautiful beings of light. So the scripture says, Jesus sent his only son. For the literalists, it's that God sent Jesus and Jesus was the exception, right? But that's not what's really happening here. What's really happening here is that the living spirit breathed life into every single, single one of us and calls it its son and daughter, the anointed one. What did Jesus do? Jesus took time to remember his anointing. Jesus created hermetically sealed times of stillness and silence where he remembered who he was. And then he felt confident in standing in front of a group of not, not people that wanted to hear from him, but people that didn't want to hear from him and still be the message. And still be the thing because he was confident. He was empowered. He knew because he took time to remember who he really was. I've shared this with you before. One of my previous churches, we walked around calling each other. We just started calling each other Christ, right? First name, last name, Christ. Randy Christ will be the one that I always remember. The Christ presence, the anointing that lives as each one of us. But we can't just go around pretending. Because then at some point, we'll be exploited. But we continue to pray and meditate and listen. And so this is, this is how, what this has to do with loving kindness. 
This is how God showed its love among us. God sent its only son, it, the spirit. This is the spirit that we talk about, the anointing. The Christ is the anointing, the Christ, the anointed one. The living spirit that is your life, that is my life. Stop, take a moment right now, put your hand on your heart and just know that you are a living spiritual being. It said, we say this so much, I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. The first thing that we are is a spirit. Think about where we come from. Think about the, 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 the smallest little window of, I mean, not to get in too much into bi the biology of all of it, but man, I mean, we've all taken sexual education and know how a human being is made, right? Holy smokes, it's a miracle. It's fantastic. And that spirit comes from someplace. So just take a moment, put your hand on your heart and just know that you're a spiritual being, that I'm a spirit. And so we have this mass surrounding our spirit, this gravitational pull. And hasn't science showed us, didn't they do an experiment at one point that, that when so, they've done an actual experiment about this, that when someone died, their body was lighter than before they died. You've heard of this experiment, right? That the soul had some sort of mass, some sort of weight to it. That we're a spirit. And this is how God so showed its love in the world is to deliver itself as itself, as our lives. This is something we have to meditate on, gang. I mean, it, sometimes it sounds like, what? I'm so human. Look how human I am. I'm human. Look at how human I am. The, the skin bag and the, you know, and I got to go to the bathroom often and I got to go to the born bathroom more often and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like the gravitational pull of the human condition which is why it's so important to have these times of remembrance daily, 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 because it's so easy to get caught up in, oh, I cut my hand, it hurts, right? I'm a spirit. Do I stop and do I look in the mirror from time to time and say, oh, there's the spirit? How often, I mean, we, we, we look into people's eyes and you say you can see their soul. You can see their sparkle or their lack of connection to it. I can look in their eyes and see the darkness. It's not because there's a darkness that's forming around them or some evil spirit or demon. It's because we're not experiencing our connection. And when we experience our connection, there's a sparkle that happens with us. We are a, a spiritual being. God sent its only son, its own being. Start, stop looking at this as masculine and feminine or boy and girl, but rather a spirit, a being. Ladies, how, how, how unfair would it be? It's only son? What about, well, all of us? It's only being to dwell among us that we might live through it. That we might live through it, it says. God sent its only being into the world that we might. Why would it say might? Free will. Because he could choose to honor it or not. Why would the scribe say that we might live? Not that we do, not that we have to, not that it's imperative, that we might. Because we can either choose to worship that spirit and that presence that's within us or not. And I declare this morning that we will have a world filled with much more loving kindness when each of us are taking time in that hermetically sealed time to know that we are a spiritual being having that human experience and live from that place and share from that place and talk from that place, the dignity that comes with it, the specialness that comes with it, the beauty that comes from it, that, that I find myself using different words and, and, and words of affirmation and proclamation because I have chosen to live through it. This is how God showed that it loved each one of us, that it delivered a spirit, that we have the privilege and the responsibility and the beauty and the opportunity to live in this human experience. And then what are we going to do with it? And then what shall I do with it? Loving kindness even feels better, doesn't it? It feels better. When we're gathered in loving kindness, it, see, I just look at all your faces. You're like, yeah, it sure does. There's that just kind of relief. Like, yeah, it feels better to live in loving kindness. It's the most natural thing. Do you know how much pain we're in when we're living from some, from otherness? How much pain exists? How much anger and upset? And, 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 and gang, 
Don't get me wrong. In the human experience, we have plenty of opportunity to other. We have plenty of opportunity to be angry, don't we? There's plenty of opportunity to be upset because they did me wrong and they're not doing what I want them to do. Someone didn't treat me well. Someone upset me. So in the human experience, there's a lot of opportunity to not be loving kindness. But it doesn't feel good, does it? Being in loving kindness is in accord with our nature. God so loved each one of us that we can reenact it too. That let me reenact it, that I so love the world that I might, that I will, that I may dis be a dispensary of this loving kindness. Be a dispensary of this goodness. Be a dispensary of this joy. It's important to do as an individual, but as a why do we come together as community? Because community has more mass. There's more um, um, peer pressure that's evolved with it. There's more like, oh, that's the cool thing to do. We get to be a, a, a what do you call it these days? A, 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 an influencer. We could be a collection of influence of loving kindness by not might live through it, but do live through it. This is how God showed its love among us. That God sent its only being, its only, its, its only expression into the world that we might live through it. Want to? You want to? Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to? I mean, there's something there, right? I know we get bashful in church. I, sometimes I don't like it. Like, don't make me say anything. Don't make me declare. Don't do a call and response. I understand. But then there's something that happens when we say it together. We make a commitment. We make a, there's 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 a movement that happens when we have our word. That we might live through it, that we do live through it. So today, if you've heard anything else, what I would like you to hear is this, that there's an invitation that is laid squarely before us, a picnic table, a, 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 a spread of the possibility of living in the spirit, of remembering daily our spiritual nature and taking the time necessary to remember it, taking the time necessary to recreate it, taking the time necessary to be that generative presence of loving kindness and to be it. And if, it's, and, and if it's not easy to love over here, then go love over there. If you, if you don't beat your head against the wall to try and love here to, to, to heal something or make something better, just kind of pivot. I mean, there's even books written around it now. The power of the pivot. <laughs> you know, the demons are coming from over there. I don't hurt. Take a breath with me, would you? Would you just take a breath with me? I'm not commanding it of you. I'm just inviting, inviting you to take a breath with me because it feels good too. In that moment of breath, we can connect. Mm. Love and kindness is the most natural thing when we're in tune, when we're in a groove, when we're in a flow with the idea that God, this is how God loved the world. It breathed itself into it out of its own imagination, out of its own infinite possibility, its own prosperity and abundance and joy and love and kindness and peace and, and, and beauty that it breathed life into each one of us. And this is our DNA gang. This is our DNA. All of those things, those words that we give uh, 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 to, to kind of humanize it, but we know when we meditate, we know when we pray that that's who I really am is possibility. And so let me, let me take some time to remember, and then I can move from that place. You see, then I can move from that center. I can groove from that center. I can dance with the spirit. I can dance with my fellow human beings, and I can pivot toward loving kindness all the time. I can move with it. I can dance with it. But I have to remember, when I forget, it's easy to be mean. It's easy to be mean when I forget. But when I remember, ah, the most easy thing for me to do and be, the most 
peaceful thing for me is to be loving kindness right now. I'm going to breathe into that. Oh, we have an opportunity this morning. Right now, we have an opportunity. There's an opportunity that sits before us to be it, to move from might to may to yes. That we might live through it, that we do live through it, that we do allow it, that we do live in it this morning. I'm grateful for it. I bless this community. I, I bless it from, from my knowing right now of our oneness, from my knowing right now of our togetherness, our community, our, 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 our opportunity to say yes individually, but also as a community. To live in a greater joy and to live in a greater loving kindness, a greater givingness, a greater service, a greater possibility. Individually taking care of our own needs, but then as we see that, that we can't help but be that presence everywhere that we are, that's how it includes others. That's how it includes others. So we're it. This is the group. This is the group. And this is the crew. It's the gang. Spiritual gangsters. We are a gang. And we are going to spread our gang of goodness everywhere this week. We're a gang of love. And possibility and joy. I'm grateful for it. I recognize it as a blessing. I call it forth as such, right out of life, right out of the middle of life, as life, as goodness, as the sweet, juicy nectar of life, as each one of us. I'm grateful. Call it good. And so it is.